mostly within the context of comparing feed-forward control with feedback control. So up to now, you know that the, the general... Um, The general look of a feed-forward scheme is that we have the controller talking to the system and the thing that we're trying to uh, control is just coming out of the system on the right-hand side. So that's the general information flow scheme of feed-forward control. The idea is that this controller is connected up in such a way so that the thing that is going into the controller is different from the thing that we are trying to control. That's the, that's the key idea behind feed-forward. And in most cases, so there are let's say, two different versions of feed-forward control. Uh, in all cases, it's a controller. And so a controller has, at least on high level, when we design the controller, it has the goal of maintaining the controlled variable at some uh, set point. Right? So uh, if, if we say we're trying to build a controller, what we most of the time will mean is that we're trying to build a device that will have the effect that it will uh, either allow us to keep that controlled variable on set point, and, or let's say, uh, given changing set point, And that's called the servo problem or changing disturbances. And that's called disturbance rejection, right? Most feed forward controllers in the world are not used to track set point, but rather to improve disturbance rejection rejection. And so for the vast majority of cases where feed-forward is used, the thing that is coming in in this side is a disturbance. And so this feed-forward scheme, in other words, says this controller is measuring a disturbance and it is making changes to the manipulated variable in such a way as to counteract the predicted effect of that disturbance on the system. And so if we were to build out the full block diagram of the feed-forward information scheme, we would say that the disturbance has an effect Oh, let me do this again. On that controlled variable. <laughs> now, if you're looking at that diagram and saying, but wait, Cole, what if this effect is something other than an additive effect? What if we know that this disturbance changes the properties of a heat exchanger transfer coefficient? Or what if we know that this changes the reaction rate of a reactor in some weird nonlinear way? The easy answer is, within the realm of linear analysis where we live, if we're talking about linear systems, linear controllers, we're going to say that every possible effect is additive in linear systems. You'll remember this is kind of a theme, right? There's only one thing, there's only one way in which systems have a simultaneous effect on a variable, and that is that they're added together. So if, you, if, you, if you're wondering, like, how do I indicate this weird 
change in rate constant or multiply or whatever, the answer is you draw a little circle and you add pluses to it. That's how you represent it, right? Because remember, the beauty of linear analysis is way back when we started with these analyses, we said it doesn't matter if, the, if that controlled variable is equal to some nonlinear effect, you know, like sine of, let's, let's call this A and B, right? Let's say that it's actually like sine of A times B, right? That's actually what happens. C is just sine of A, a times B. So nonlinear, there's not an add in sight. What was the first thing that we did when we developed our models? We said, cool, let's linearize that, right? We're going to linearize that, we're going to take that, and that's going to become like C1A plus C2B plus whatever, you know, like the kind of a bar value, C bar. Do you remember? Yes. So, uh, okay, let me just explain. So, so the question is, um, why are there two system boxes here? And the answer is, remember that the system is representing here some real, those boxes, I'm drawing the information flow because I'm trying to focus on this idea of feed forward. It becomes very complicated when you add uh, kind of the way that the system actually looks because the information flow isn't as clear. On the boxes, it's very clear that this is a feed-forward system because all the arrows go from left to right, right? All the arrows go from inputs to outputs, and there are no arrows going the other way at all, ever. That's the, that's the property of feed-forward systems. Now, if I were drawing a diagram of this, right, this could be the disturbance. This could be the controlled variable. And usually, like, we can call these things, right? So we can, we can say maybe that's, like, called, oh, sorry, that's called U, right? Or P, uh, if you're following the textbook version of this. But you see, there are actually two streams entering, if this was like a tank, right? There are two streams entering into that tank. And so there are two things, two variables that have an effect. So I haven't labeled these because I just... Uh, they would be typically different pieces of math. Does that make sense? So they would be different transfer functions, right? So, so the controller would be one piece of math, right? And this, this system relationship here would be G1, and this here would be G2. And they were, would not be equal to one another. Does that make sense? But the point is that those boxes both represent the system. Right? But the one box represents the system's response to the disturbance. Right? And so this transfer function is going from, it's saying, if the disturbance changes, right, this transfer function tells me how that affects the control variable. Right? This transfer function here tells me if my manipulated variable changes. This is what the controller can change. How does that affect the, uh, the control variable? So if, if I want to, let, let's say, you can kind of see it in a, in a slightly different way. We can say that, that conceptually, like if I wanted to draw something that represented the same box as the physical system, you could kind of draw it this way, right? So this whole green piece, right? that has two inputs and one output, which is the control variable. That is the system mechanically. But we distinguish between the effects that these different variables have on the system. Does that make sense? So it turns out that this is a really easy piece of math to do because um, if, if we now talk about designing a feedforward controller, which will do this rejection that I've just talked about, right? So if this is the case, so we've got two system models. We've got a system model that tells us how the manipulated variable affects the controlled variable. And we've got another 
transfer function that tells us how the disturbance affects the control variable. It is obvious, I hope to everybody, that the best thing that a controller could do is to make the controlled variable completely insensitive to the disturbance. In other words, if the disturbance changes, the feedforward controller takes action in such a way as to exactly counteract the effect of the disturbance. Does that make sense? <coughs> right? And so what we want is we want this transfer function, the transfer function that connects D and Y, to be equal to zero. Right? So effectively, if we say uh, the effect, the total effect, so if we keep all of that in, in screen here, so the total effect of, uh, of D on y, which we can write as a transfer function, y over d, right? This is much simpler than feedback control because we don't have any nasty loops. It's really, really straightforward math. The effect is simply gc g1, right, plus g2. That's it. Right? Because this is exactly the math. We, we, we can write it out a little bit longer and say, well, okay, so y is equal to a plus b, and a is equal to g1. You know, so like we can trace that back. So we can say, right, here's y. y is equal to a plus b. a is equal to g1 times u. g is equal to gc t times d, or u is equal to gc times d, and so on. And you can do that, but I think hopefully most of you can follow just that one step reduction. It's supposed to be relatively straightforward. So it's systems in parallel. Very, very easy. We just add that together. Now, if we're saying design a feedforward controller, these are the easy problems of uh, control. Because I want you to think about this as quite similar to the direct synthesis problem, right? Because in the direct synthesis problem, we specified some desired output, and then we solved for the controller. We are doing exactly the same in feedforward control. Our desired effect is zero, right? So uh, we would like that to be equal to zero. And now we can just solve. The thing that we are trying to solve for is GC. Just check my math. It's supposed to be super simple, okay? So all is right with the world, right? So isn't this wonderful? We have this amazing tool. As long as we can hook it up to the disturbance, we can, we can, measure, the, we can measure the disturbance, and there you go. You just have to calculate this G2 times the inverse of G1, uh, and, and everything is 100%. We just simulate that. We build a controller that does that, and everything is fine. So obviously, there is a problem, right? And by now, you should be attuned to the problem. Now, luckily, it's not as bad as the previous time we spoke about feed forward control, where we had to calculate a pure inverse of a real system, OK? Because what we actually want to calculate now is the, uh, the product G2 over G1. And so very easily we can see that if, G, if G2 and G1 has similar dynamics, in other words, if, 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 if we see maybe three things below the line and one thing above the line in that one, and we've got the same kind of shape, which is not crazy, right? Because it's like the same kind of system. And definitely, if it were something like this tank with the flow system, we could expect that the, that the effect of the one flow on whatever we're measuring is probably quite similar to the effect of the other flow uh, on whatever it is that we're measuring. And so in this particular case, it turns out that many cases, uh, in many cases, this inverse simplifies away to something which has similar order above and below the line. 
right? So, so you can see what's going to happen. We're going to cancel out, or we're going to have, in the case that I've specified here, where we've got like first over, set, over third order, right? So we've got like first order over third order, first order over third order. What's going to happen is that GC is kind of going to be of the order of uh, four above and four below. Is that making sense to everybody? So I'm not like actually working through it, but I hope everybody can kind of see the logic here that if I take those, if I take those fractions and I plug them into that inverse, inverse, I'll end up with something now under these conditions that I've just said. In other words, if the two functions have similar dynamics, and this is kind of broadly true in many cases, then I end up with effectively a overall zero order GC. Right? Um, and I want to focus in on this. So, so right now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about how you would actually do those calculations because that's just algebra, right? Like, like literally, that is the design equation for a feed-forward equation. If you're in the, in the mood to memorize stuff, like you can memorize that. I've never... Uh, had the moral fortitude to commit that to memory because it's so easy to derive. Like, I just find myself deriving it every time. Like, my brain doesn't like memorization. But um, the, the key idea is I've got two process or two system transfer functions, two transfer functions that describe system behavior. One describing the behavior of the system responding to the controlled or the manipulated variable, and one describing the behavior of the system responding to the disturbance. If I have those two things and a measurement of the disturbance, I'm set up to do feed-forward control. I can then find a perfect. Now this, if I am able to realize this, and my models are perfect, this feed-forward controller is perfect by design. In other words, given that the models are accurate, and given that my measurements are accurate, and given that all of that, you know, like, given ideal conditions, I will make a disturbance, and the controller will exactly counteract the effect of the disturbance. Just exactly. And so the disturbance will happen, but nothing will happen to the output of the system. That's, let's say, the absolute best case. Things that mess with this are obviously any imbalance in the orders which make GC not physically realizable. So these, these uh, zero order systems, and you'll see that a, a lot of people struggle with this idea, uh, or kind of they don't really understand why the textbook makes such a big deal about this thing called a lead lag unit when it comes to feed forward controllers. And I, I think this is the most clear illustration that I've come up with of why lead lag units will tend to be a huge thing in uh, feed forward control. Because you can see that is simply a sequence of lead lag units. Uh, let me make that even halfway legible. Um, So here we have this idea, and this follows directly from just following through the reasoning behind having that expression over there, right? So this is the design equation. Right? So that just says, if you have these two transfer functions, plug it into that equation and you get a feed-forward controller. Right? It results, if you just reason through it, in this stack, this series combination of the same kind of thing over the same kind of thing over the same kind of thing over the same kind of thing. Obviously, we are stingy as engineers, right? Or maybe, I mean, that's a negative light to put it in. We have a financial obligation to our employers to minimize costs, <laughs> right? 
Um, partly that's what they're paying us for. And so because of that, in many cases, if we find that it is okay or that we get reasonable performance by leaving out some of those terms, we should. Just like if we find we get okay performance with the PI controller, we should leave out the D, right? If we get okay performance with the P controller, we should leave out the I. If the variable isn't very important, maybe we don't even control it at all, right? Each one of those decisions saves money. So this hopefully kind of closes the loop on where do these lead lag units now suddenly come from? Because the textbook, like, I think doesn't lead you down that path just as nicely as this. It, it doesn't focus on this idea that the feed-forward systems will tend to be zero-order net systems, right? And on a very basic level, just like a first-order response or a first-order system is literally the, the simplest system that exhibits dynamics that you can picture. Right? It, because it's a first order differential equation. A lead lag system is the simplest zero order system. There's no, there's no simpler system that is still zero order. You have to have at least one order above the line and at least one order below the line. And if you're wondering, so what machinery do I use to get from this long list of of brackets to a short list of brackets, just go back to CPN to all of those approximation methods. Right, so all of the approximation methods you know, Bardet approximation, Taylor approximation, uh, Skorkestad's method, all of those, they also work, obviously, to reduce the order of feed-forward controls. Now, once we have done that, so if the, if the model is perfect, right, so under these assumptions of absolutely perfect model, Remember, what we will see, and now I, I think it's quite important here that you also understand, it's, it's one of the things that I'm finding it really hard to actually get through to a modern student who interacts through the computer with the system. Understand that when we're doing the math, we're allowed to see D. The math, right, says, oh, here is D over there, right? D is there, and we get this thing over here, right? In normal systems, we don't see D. We have to take special steps to get to D. We have to install something. We have to go on site and say, please, can I install a flow meter? And if that flow meter is something like an orifice device, that means I'm going to have to cut open a pipe, which means I'm going to have to stop the plant, which means my boss is going to be very, very angry. Right? Because remember, we have a financial obligation to maximize the profits of our employer. And so if we cut into that pipe, the plant stops making profit, and that's a bad thing. So it's not as simple as just choosing a line on the curve and saying, well, you know, feed-forward is a great idea. You have to understand that feed-forward almost always is an augmentative technique. Very few people would, or very few plants, have feed-forward as the only control scheme. Feed-forward is added to a feedback control scheme, which makes the diagram a lot harder to understand, and it, it kind of shows you a little bit why the diagrams in the textbook look to the way they do, because real responsible application of feed forward control always has feedback in there as well. Right, but given that, given that we have an accurate measurement on the disturbance, right, um, what we will see is a disturbance entering in, so this would be if we were drawing trends, we would see D doing something, right, and Y doing nothing. So, in the ideal case, if all the models are right and the measurement is good and all blah, 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 Y just stays completely flat while D changes. In fact, what happens, now, the, the second part of what I just said about disturbances not being available, remember that 
we've now cut open the pipe and we've installed our orifice plate so we know that the flow is coming in uh, and we know what the flow is. But it is almost impossible to imagine being able to change D. Because if D were in our control, if D were something that like has a valve on it, right? It wouldn't be a D. It wouldn't be a disturbance. So if we can choose D, like the best kind of control is just to make D not change so much. Right? Like if that's within our power to do, we should do it. So it's much better to insulate your, your tank. If you worry about ambient temperatures affecting your tank, it's a lot better just to insulate the tank. Right? Like just remove that disturbance completely. Uh, but if you are worried about rain, like we can't sit at the control panel and say, right, okay, guys, make a drain, and then we'll see whether that has an effect. So we have to wait and see what happens. So the tuning example that he has in the book, where they are effectively changing D and then manipulating the feedforward parameters in order to uh, to get to a good response, understand that that involves you sitting in that control room for several days waiting for a, a, for a disturbance to happen. Right? So you're sitting there, you're babysitting this controller, you, somebody phones you, okay, it's happening, right? Like, there's a disturbance. You, you run in, you start twiddling knobs, and you kind of do that until... So it's not like offline tuning or anything like that. Because remember, if you had good offline models, you wouldn't need the tuning in the first place. Right? Like if you had off, uh, good offline models, you would just use the best models that you had and like do the calculation and be done. Why are you tuning? Because you don't trust your models. Because you think the response that you got by using the models isn't actually as good as you wanted. It's just like the control design stuff that we've done. Right? If the models are right, you can choose exactly what kind of response you want. If you want a first order response, do direct synthesis, get the controller, there you go. If you trust your simulations, you can just install that controller directly and never tune it at all. You're tuning because of this thing. And so that's an important second thing. That's another thing that isn't explicitly mentioned in the book. But understand that it is almost never the case that you can just reach in and change the disturbance <coughs> by its very nature. The only reason why we're doing this is so that we can counter these disturbances that come in randomly. It's different for a controller because controllers can respond to set points and set points we choose. I can choose the set point but I can't choose the disturbance and I can't make it happen most of the time. So understand that when you're thinking about tuning you're thinking quite differently about tuning feed forward controllers and tuning uh, feedback controllers. Cool. Uh, that's it for this first session. That's the